So we are here at the Highlands Ridge Golf Club that was owned by the University of Denver. Jim, what is it called now? It's the University of Denver Golf Club at Highlands Ranch, which is a mouthful, but it is the University of Denver Golf Club. And we're going to talk about why it's called that yeah. later on. My name is Mark Stevenson, on behalf of the Highlands Ranch Historical Society. We welcome you for coming to do today and sharing any of your insights and being important people in the development of golf in Highlands Ranch. One of our members suggested that we do this interview and suggested that you would be important people to talk to for people who are interested in how golf has developed in the Highlands Ranch community at this point. So, welcome. So, tell me who you are. My name is Bill Leffler, uh, my wife Sandy and I. And, uh, we first got started uh, when we bought the Lynx Golf Course in 1992. Uh, let's talk about your background for a minute. Okay. You were a Denver native? Born in uh, Denver, grew up in the Cheeseman Park area, mm -hmm. uh, moved to uh, Inglewood in 1969. How old were you at the time? Uh, 13. 13. So in 1956. You never went to Denver East? My brother did. I ended up at Cherry Creek. Cherry Creek. Yeah. yeah my daughter went there also. Oh, really? At this point. Uh -huh. Good school. At that point. Were you involved in sports of any type while you were at Cherry Creek? Uh, the golf team, uh, I played on the golf team at Cherry Creek uh, all three years. And uh, that was it. I played lacrosse uh, earlier. Um, but, uh, and skied, but I was just golf at Cherry Creek. Man, golf. Yeah. So, eventually you graduated, and you got the decision of where, if anywhere, to go for college. Yeah. So you know, I, I was off of the Arizona State. Yeah. How did you come to pick there, and what other things did you consider? I was uh, offered a scholarship at Arizona State, and um, uh, a couple school by school in Weber State in Utah. And um, I thought I'd, I'd try the desert golf and good weather for the winter, so I went to Arizona State. No. Good choice. It was a good choice. It was a good, good, good choice. I'm sure you had a great modesty, but did you end up as an All American? I was. My junior year, I was an All American and uh, just had uh, a wonderful team. We had uh, good chances each year to win the, uh, the national championship, and we came close every year but couldn't quite do it but uh, I had a, a decent career one a few times and uh, just enjoyed every minute of it. So, so you graduated and then probably had some decisions on what to do with the rest of your life. Yeah, I, I was always thought I was uh, going to be a golf professional, a professional golfer yeah. and so I immediately turned pro after school and started my quest to get on the tour. Did you move back here, or did you stay? Uh, my base is here. Uh, mm -hmm. My father was. We were fortunate enough to uh, belong to Cherry Ridge Country Club, and uh, so I grew up there in their junior program. And the golf pros helped me immensely there, and that's where I met Sandy's father, who was, was instrumental in helping me move forward in my golf career. He's a Hall of Fame golfer for the college. Moore. And we became friends, and uh, through that relationship, I was best friends with his son, Marty Moore, and then met Sandy, and of course, fell head over hill when she was sure. 15 or something. Sandy, you have brothers and a sister. I have one brother, two sisters. And yeah, where does that fit into the big thing? Um, well, older sister, older sister, older brother, me, and younger sister. Julia is the younger? Yes. Yeah. Martin is the older brother? Yes. And then an older sister, Rhonda. So when did you meet this joker? Well, I know he, he would be hanging out in the house with my brother as I'd come in and out from the barn. And um, I just kind of knew him. And then when we 
I went to Arizona State as well. Uh, he was a couple years ahead of me, and we really started dating at, in college. Mm -hmm. And so you got married what year again? 1983. 1983. Okay. At this point, then, you had just come off of the PGA Tour. Yes, I played uh, three years on the tour and wasn't, uh, my progression wasn't going well. I, I really wasn't doing what I had hoped or meeting my goals. So I left the tour and uh, petitioned for my amateur status back. And that took three years of no golf. I didn't realize that it was possible. Once you're a pro, I thought mm -hmm. you were always a pro. Yeah, you can petition the USGA uh, and based on your record, uh, and I don't know how it is now, but back then based on your record and earnings was how long you had to wait before you could get your amateur status back. So you, you decided to stop the incessant travel PGA Tour Yes. And it, you came back to Denver? Yes. And uh, I tried to get involved in various jobs, uh, but golf was always at the, in my heart. Um, and so no matter what I tried to do, I always came back to wanting to be in the golf business. So. Did you have a PGA Pro certification at that point, or did you have to earn that? I had to earn that. Um, I worked at uh, Inverness Golf Club, uh, Beaver Creek Golf Club, and Castle Pines Golf Club and became a Class A member mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, just before we bought the links. Were you an assistant pro at that point? Yes, at, at, at those three. It was back in the years, not too far after that, that uh, the International still came to Castle Pines. Yes. Yes, the, there's something here in your uh, area here on the, the photo from 1986. Yeah, at this point, isn't that something? I saw you tweet to you off in that tournament in the international. At the international, oh my god, did I hit it out of bounds or anything? <laughs> oh, the first hole was all downhill. Yeah, yeah I think, thankfully, <laughs> and it just kept going and rolling and rolling <laughs> at this point. But <clears throat> wonderful place, yeah, it's a so shame. Anything you have a problem? Well, he, he's, I mean, he's always loved golf, and he played the Asian tour. He'd do anything and everything he did, could to be competitive, and he was actually, when he regained his amateur status, opened a ton of doors for him because he won the U.S. mid-amateur, which got him on the Walker Cup team, which got him to play in the Masters as an amateur. Mm -hmm. So between being pro and turning pro again, there was lots of good stuff in between that um, the amateur golf really. And there was some travel. There was some what? Travel. Yes. Yep. Yeah. There was a yeah. lot of travel. A lot of senior rule. I assume that you might have had success in Colorado State tournaments as well. I had uh, some. I was. I was lucky enough to win the high school championship and the state amateur championship and, and uh, a couple Colorado Opens and uh, Colorado Senior Opens. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. And low amateur, I played Colorado. Let's talk about the links. Love to. I just moved to Glacier's Village. A couple months ago, oh, really? uh, we played the course uh, for several years on one occasion, but we're by no means good golfers or regular golfers, but we're familiar with the development at this point. My understanding is Mission Diego, the original developer of the community, built that course. Yes. What do you know about that process? I'm assuming this happened sometime in the mid 1980s. 1985. Yeah, they built it and ran it until we bought it. Um, they had uh, Dick Hartman uh, was there when we bought it, and he had worked for them. I don't know how long Dick worked for Mission Diego, but I think he may have been the only pro. I think he was the first pro. First pro at this point. And uh, I understand he was passed recently too. Oh, really? Yeah. Sorry to hear. I've been told by some other people. 
Very nice to know. It's no longer with us. Oh, it's fine. Did you go and teach at Denver? Denver? Yes, he became the teaching pro at Denver Country Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, very, very wonderful. He and I remember his wife would run the grill when we were looking at the property. Uh, she would run the grill, and he said that was the toughest time in their marriage because things weren't going well. And, and, and yet, Sandy and I, I think we've had a, a wonderful relationship. I, uh, we ran both the grill and the maintenance and the golf shop. And I mean, when you own something, you run everything. And uh, from cleaning restrooms to you know, up raising bunkers and things. Because like <laughs> when you're in the golf business, that's seven days a week yeah. if the sun is up. I mean, just waiting for you guys here today, I came early and saw that and checked the room out. And I see the level of attention to detail that people have here. Yeah. To make sure that things are clean, and something clean off for the preparation for the event here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very proud of the people we, we hired. Uh, many are still here, even though we're not. Uh, most of the management staff is still here at and, both courses. And the maintenance and, staff, both courses. And uh, they're just a joy to work with. Uh, good people. So 1992, we bought the links. Mm -hmm. You formed a company called what? Fairways and Greens. Yeah. How did you come to pick that name? Her dad picked it. Uh, he thought it was very appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were the sole buyers. We had we had a team of investors, investors uh, including Hale Irwin and Dale Douglas, who were multi-year PGA Tour champions. Um, a local pro named Stacy Hart was also a, a, an investor. But uh, so we came in with a group in '92 bought it, kind of wanted to transform the, uh, not the ambience, but we wanted to make it more of a, a personal golf experience for players rather than a Mission Diego company. You know, you had to keep the carts on the path. You, they wouldn't take um, checks. Interesting. <laughs> I was like, how do you have any people playing here? So we got all the carts off the path. We, we took whatever, we took pennies if you want to do it with us, but we tried to ingratiate ourselves with the neighborhood a little bit. We got new range balls. And we got new range balls. <laughs> Those balls were so old. <laughs> so I, most importantly, I think we bought, we brought in a superintendent over both courses that really knew how to, I was very proud of our quality of what the golf experience was like. The greens were always per perfect at both courses and the fairways were great. And it seemed like 99% of the people that played really enjoyed it. So that was good. That was a good feeling. When you walked around the links, uh, other than bringing in a superintendent that you just mentioned, what are the major changes, if any, that you make to the course itself? The course is just the last time yeah. I saw yeah. it, Phelps, I thanked him yeah. because it's a great design. It's we didn't have to really do anything except upgrade the maintenance of it a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, we both love, like love the design. It's fun to play. Anybody can play. We have ladies leagues. At one point, we had over twenty some leagues playing, which. You know, on a, on a weekly basis, so they keep coming back, so that got to mean they like it. And, uh, so we didn't do anything really to the structure. No more smoking in the grill. Yeah, we could. That made a big that difference. Is. And um, we did get a new food and beverage manager who did a great job for us. Um, of course, there's been maintenance and upgrades and, you know, new pumps and new equipment, and we remodeled the clubhouse. Eight years ago, yeah. Um, so, but that's just running a business, yeah. and we had erosion issues. And Forest helped us with very much. Yeah. Yeah. Metro District was very helpful on the, at both courses on the on the 
erosion issues we had, Perry Nolan and his crew and Danny Griffin. Good. So <clears throat> that took a fair amount of your effort uh, from 92 when you bought it through uh, the mid 90s, 95, 96, when you started thinking about a regulation like yours. What was your thought at that point of expanding beyond just the links? Well, this is funny because Kevin McCallum was a 14 year old boy who was our outside man at service manager. He managed so all the good. carts, he hired all his friends, we just left it to him. And his father happened to be president of Mission Diego. That was Craig McCallum. Craig McCallum. Yeah, he was the number two guy yeah. under Jim Tepper. And eventually retired in the late 1980s. Yeah. And Kevin Caddy for Bill in two Colorado Opens. In two Colorado Opens. And Mission Viejo actually was looking to sell the development. And most of the prospective buyers said, where's your regulation course? So because we kind of, they got to know us through Kevin and we got to know that we started conversations about building a golf course. And it, it worked for both parties because then Mission, like we said, sold the property midstream. They got it sold, which is actually funny because Shay would have built their own golf course because they know how to do that. Mission wanted to sell yeah. because the corporate parent, Paul Morris, Mm -hmm. Wanted to sell a mission. Um, yeah. And in fact, get out of the housing business and do other mm -hmm. things that were core to their business. They had a lot of other interests, but this was just this one aspect. Yeah. So they decided to sell. We'd always wanted to build one, and our outside service manager was the connection. <laughs> 14 so, okay. He did a great job. He said it made him very popular at school because everyone wanted to work there. So, so 200 acres, and you had to figure out a design. Yes, and luckily, uh, one of our investors, Hale Irwin, uh, had a very close relationship with her dad for many years, and me uh, a little bit on tour. Uh, did you, Sandy? Did your dad go see you? No, he went to the University of Denver on a golf scholarship. Right, right. Yeah, and my mother went to the University of Denver on a scholastic scholarship. Hale, of course, was a football player. Right. Let's see. Let's Dad was a passion for your dad. Dad watched Hale as a junior golfer, and Dad was one of the best golf amateurs, and Hale was still an amateur, and Dad actually beat him in the Broadmoor Invitational, which he never yeah. let him with down. So they had a long term relationship. So they all got picked. And you had a couple hundred acres that somehow got acquired. Yeah. The uh, through negotiations with Ron and Mission Viejo, uh, we came up with this property and uh, it, it turned out spectacular. Hale, Hale's uh, architect Stan Gentry, uh, we come out quite often and, and we walk the course and tweak it a little bit. Hale's philosophy in golf is a little different than other architects in that he wants a, a woman or a, back, a golfer that shoots 100 to have as much fun as a golfer that shoots 65. That so, means she put a lot of tee boxes. A lot of tee boxes and not very many force and carries, where you have to carry it over a hazard or a sharp coast. So that's what's great about the links. You can run the ball up here. You can run the ball up, uh, and uh, everybody. I mean, I just think it's a wonderful golf course. It's been a great course. course once, and what I remember was narrow fairways mm -hmm. and low elevation changes, mm -hmm. particularly on the west oh, end, uh, on the west side of the course. Uh -huh. Uh, one of our, our friends for a long time uh, has been the, the Palm Scrows. And I understand that with Gordon's role with uh, the Highlands Ranch Community Association, there might have been some concern about having a golf course 
taking money that could be used for other business uses. Uh, you want to talk about that? And how did, if so, and how did you overcome those concerns? They're really people, most people want more open space. So this actually, and this probably opened up some other property that was already deemed open space that now they could build on, but this did expand the open space quota that the developer had and and Stan and Mission Viejo worked very closely together to make the routing so that the it enhanced the views of the homes and still provided a, new, a good golf course and then there's the beautiful holes right around the Highland Canal that that was unbuildable property because it's in a it's in a flood zone this so yeah no down here yeah Mars oh yeah Mars and Gulch. Mars and Gulch. so I understand that there have been floods that damage the course over the years a big one yeah really and, and Benson, yeah her general manager had mentioned that it was significant. So that was a big project, getting that repaired. Um, we had to pick people up on the 12th green and drive them backwards to the 13th team. Wow. Yeah. We, for, we couldn't access. For a long time. So <laughs> I think this, it wasn't a battle to get this in. People wanted this. Yeah, I, I think overwhelming support was there for this. Uh, and I, 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 I believe it's enhanced Thailand's ranch. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think the community embraces it, and they should. It's a, it's a nice thing to have. If I lived, if I lived right there, I'd, I'd love it. Sure. I mean, there's not a house right next to me, and there's, I can walk and have a decent meal, meal in the grill, and a beer if I want, or go play golf, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's true. So this started as a public course, and eventually it became semi private as well. well. Yeah. Tell us what inspired that decision. Money. Uh, we thought if we sold X number of memberships annually, it would pay for the clubhouse. We could pay for the clubhouse. Because we didn't have a clubhouse when we started. We were, we were in the trade. When was the clubhouse built? 2002-3? I'm going to say 2002. Mm -hmm. And you know, we ran it for a few years out of a, a double Y, and it was fine. We could have done that forever. Sure. But we, you know, the community needs a nice clubhouse, and we hired a a, a very uh, well-known clubhouse architect who's won awards, so uh, Bill Sinstowski, and. Uh, he came up with this, and, and Sandy tweaked it correctly to her liking. And I think it functions very nicely. Your membership is capped at what these days? I've lost track, but I think it's 250. Mm -hmm. um, and is that right? What benefits do members have as opposed to the public? I'm sorry, what's that? What benefits do members have as opposed to the public that's coming in? Tea time. They get preferred tea times, I mean, more advanced, so if the tea times open to the public five days in advance, I think they open to the members seven days in advance, and they don't pay green fees, but they do pay cart fees, mm -hmm. and, and there's member events, you know, there's a member member, there's a member guest, um, and Andy does a really good job here making those fun and creative. And there's a camaraderie with the members, and you have you can easily get games. And um, I think they have a waiting list for the membership, and so it's very popular. Yeah. 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 So things go on. Um, Clubs open. Public for a few years. Uh, memberships are sold. That takes for a clubhouse being built. And 2003 arrives, and Sandy from you, it must have been a difficult year. My understanding, your, your dad had a long running cancer. You want to tell yeah. me no. about how this all affected everything? Um, 
Well, Derek has always been a great mentor to both of us in, in golf and in business and just in life. I mean, he had an insanely um, lo logic Common about him. Sense. Yeah, you couldn't argue with him ever because you're just like, well, <laughs> I mean, he tried. My older sister always tried. And he just, you know, the granddaughter of Nebraska boy that worked his way up, he just had a real good. He always said, if you take all the emotions out of the decision, the decision becomes very clear. And that didn't mean he wasn't emotional and he didn't get happy or sad, but when it came to a major decision, he would just focus on the issue. So he loved the University of Denver. It gave him his start. He was a great friend with Dan Ritchie, who was the chancellor for a long time. And Dad wanted to build. He and Dan Ritchie, Dad went to DU on a golf scholarship. The golf team ceased to exist. Dad and Dan Ritchie started up the golf program again. And it was all my dad's doing and talking to Dan about it and Dan was going to help support it and his next goal he got the teams going had great coaches but you know Colorado is not the easiest place to recruit because it's not like Bill went to Arizona State you can play all the time so they had to get something and a golf course a lot of universities have their own golf courses and that gives the team a place to play, a place to hang out. You know, right now they're trying to fundraise to build like a clubhouse for the teams so that they'll have hitting bays and, you know, kind of a place for them to gather and talk about golf. And, and um, so that was always my dad's goal was to get them a golf course. And he was trying to build one by one, do whatever. And that was never coming together. So at one point, we were very good friends with Peg Bradley Dockus, who was the athletic director, and she was a good friend of my mother's. We knew all the golf coaches. We admired Dan Ritchie, who was still the chancellor, and thought, you know, we could make Dad's dream come true while Mom is still here, even though Dad is not. And so the whole family was behind it, and, you know, it's always we're very close with our staffs and it's always been a, a you know i've always had i think a good business person is always looking for their exit plan instead of just oh one of us is sick we got a fire sale so even though we weren't really ready to retire we would still have the links and the links is just a treasure so we started talking to du about it and it just all the pieces started coming together and you know if we'd hit a roadblock we would have just said no problem we can keep it we love it but the pieces just came together the university was excited about it 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 just it was a very very gratifying process for me personally to accomplish something that i knew was important to my father so it's beautiful i think the teams love it it's probably not quite hard enough for them, but they did add some back tees for those guys. And there's nothing wrong with shooting low scores. It gives you confidence. So it's, um, I think, I think it's worked out great for everybody. It's a win. -win. It's a very generous game. It, it, you know, it, it's a joy to be able to be. It was not from us. It was from my parents, and um, I was proud to facilitate that. So, did you stop your day to day involvement with uh, this club at that point and focus mm -hmm. more on the links mm -hmm. at that point? Yes. Yeah. We, uh, we stipulated that, uh, and it was because of Rod, which is also, but the club is doing well and all proceeds have to, cannot go into the general fund of the University of Denver, they have to go toward the ladies and men's golf team. So 100% of what the proceeds are from this club benefit the golf teams, which I think is good. That was good. But yeah, we left, uh, we left Highlands Ranch when, uh, when DU took over and uh, focused uh, on running the links, which was already 
being run by uh, Jason Brandt and Rob Hunt, our two golf pros. Uh, Jason had been there 20 years and Rob 15 or something like that. So they did work with Jason at Castle Pines? No, Jason uh, was hired as an assistant pro. Uh, where was Jason he before? Was West. Rolling Hills? Yeah. And uh, he came over, gosh, I don't know what year, but uh, he started working there and he hired Rob Hunt. And Jason eventually became the head pro and Rob the assistant pro. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day, maybe a year or two after this was transferred to the U, uh, they came to us and said, hey, you know, if you ever think about retiring, selling this, we would like to have the chance to buy it. And Sandy and I weren't really thinking of selling it, but we got to thinking about it and we thought if we were to sell this to Troon Golf or Club Corps or some big company, Jason and Rob would be fired because they would be, they would be thought of as making too much money. And those big companies are all about you know, the bottom line. We said, why wouldn't we just sell it to them? And so we gave them a number and they, they went out and got a small business loan. And a, and a regular loan. And their and parents gave them money. On them. Yeah. We on won't them. go into all their all details. The yeah, but they, they worked it out. And it took some time. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but. Um. This all money was around 2019. So, right before COVID hit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talked to them. Yeah, and I asked them about COVID. Yeah. And they said, oh, gee, okay. <laughs> when that started hitting big time around March of that year, yeah. everything kind of closed. They'd only owned it for two months or a month. And eventually they got exception. Yeah, pulled it open up. June or July or whatever it was. Everybody wanted to get outside. And they wanted to get out with appropriate guidelines for them. I asked them today, I said, how are you doing? Well, I live in a community now. <laughs> I drive by it every day. I see the parking lots always filled. And I asked them, and Jason looked at his scheduling software, and he said, well, we're running between 95 and 99% occupancy. And I can see that from driving over the bridge and having three holes. But there's always somebody on those three holes. It well, doesn't matter if it's 6 in the morning or it's 7.30 at night. It's the same here. Um, if you think about it, the city is going vertical, so there's more people per square mile. And golf, there's no room to build new golf courses close in. There's a few new golf courses up north. There's, we, when we were running the links initially, you knew when the Broncos played and you knew when the Rockies played because the sheet would get empty. Interesting. And, yeah. no, and we had to run Broncos specials and, you know, the Rockies, when they were new and everyone loved them and we had to discount our rates and do all kinds of creative things to get people out there. And now, there's none of that. Every golf course, not just these two, every golf course we know is at capacity almost all the time. Wow. Yeah. The so, problems stay out of the way. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so since you sold the links uh, to the guys in 2019, what occupies most of your time on these guys? <laughs> Same still into horses quite a bit. Are you still picking up the whole month? No, I'm not. Um, both of my current horses are retired, so I, of course, visit them and care for them and look after them. Um, I, I don't have anything to ride at the moment, but, you know, I've, I've showed and competed, and I'm watching the dressage right there um, at the Olympics, and um, it's my passion. I play golf. I, we love to hike. We, we walk a ton. We... My family still has some business interests, and, and we manage those. And we, um, we, I, I'm actually like, how did I have time to work? I am so busy. 
Your brother's still involved with the scare team. Right? No, that was sold probably boy, that was probably ten years ago as well. Mm -hmm. And there were some other banks in New Mexico and those were sold about, about five years ago. So he he's officially retired from the banking business. And the, the banking business is um, it, it's really a very good business. You learn a lot. That's why my dad was so good at business is because people come to borrow money, you have to know about operations and you look at their numbers and, and you begin to see the trends of who is successful and who isn't and why these ones aren't successful. And so it's not just you know how to run a restaurant. You know retail, you know restaurants, you know oil business, you know residential cattle business, business, cattle business. Because dad started with all the rural banks out on the west um, western slopes and with Tome, New Mexico and Bennett, Colorado. And, um, so you really get quite the education if you're in the banking business. Which, oh, by the way, cracks me up because the banker that Jason and Rob used used to work at the range at the lakes. Yeah, he used to work close at the lakes. <laughs> he used to work the transaction for the sea of the lakes was done by a range here. <laughs> he, of course, he's married with three kids. Oh, but. You look great. It's so funny how it all overlaps. So, Bill, what would you plan a couple times a week? Uh, what occupies your time, your time these days? Well, we, we do love to hike quite a bit. We go up in the mountains uh, three or four times a week. Uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a lot. Yeah. It's getting tougher with the traffic. <laughs> but, uh, you want to play something up? Yeah. We, we're lucky we've got a place near Edwards, Colorado. Um, so we go up there, I, I, I like to fish, and uh, I do love to golf still, I love it. And, and then we go to Arizona in the, in the winter for a little bit, back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. And, uh, but we do, our time is not idle, so idle which surprised me a little bit. But, uh, well, most people I know who retire this year. Seen her when they actually worked yeah. full time. And she's a good gardener. She likes to garden. Well, I don't know if she likes it. <laughs> no, I do. But uh, so we're we just taking care of our places. And we walk dogs a lot. We love our dogs. They walk, and they used to come to work. The, the mm -hmm. shop dogs. They were famous, and so um, we, we we walk a lot, <laughs> which is good. Well, the Lynx has been around for a long time now. Yes. And what observations do you have about changes to the course itself between now and when you acquired it in 92? Yeah. Well, again, the trees, really, the trees are bigger. The trees are bigger. The, uh, the, the Lynx, they're really, we haven't changed, we haven't added teas or we just gave what Dick Phelps did, which I think was a remarkably beautiful 62-par golf course, mm -hmm. and just tried not to mess it up. Yeah. We, we actually laugh because, you know, all the private clubs, we have to redo our greens, so they're 20 years old, yeah. they're not draining. The Lynx greens are bulletproof. They get played on nonstop, and they roll perfect, and they're the original greens. Wow. Um, it's the original irrigation system. It, I mean, new pumps, new heads, new lines here and there, you know, modifications, but it is, we didn't. Everything the original design, the sprinkler design, the irrigation design, the, the greens were built beautifully. I mean, our superintendents just marvel at how good they are. I, I compare them to Castle Pines, Cherry Hills, I put them up against any greens I've ever played in my life around the world. And it's just to me. I asked Jason Umbrella, I said, what are your big concerns these days with the links? And water comes to mind. Yes. Water time. is expensive. Water is solid. And Ryan said, do you have any limits? And he said, yes, they do, but they haven't approached those limits. Yeah. But they're concerned about the dryness. Yeah. We can see this driving by. 
as the summer's gone on, we haven't had that much moisture. Uh, I got his charts, so he knows exactly. My much comes and never brings oh, My philosophy is always uh, so he's different. Watching, he's watching that quite a bit. Yeah. Just yeah. as much as he's watching his uh, capacity at the course. Well, it's the biggest. It's, it's, it's the highest number on your expense report, is the water. I mean, he over payroll over everything, and um, it's it's out of your control. And for some reason, it truly rains more at Hounds Ranch. It kind of jumps over the lakes, and then <laughs> so the lakes, um, you know, they started with two wells, and the wells don't pro pro they don't pump as much water as they used to as the aquifer changes. Oh, one well. It, one well is gone, and they have to supplement it with potable water. Here, it's all on affluent water, and the treatment station is right at the bottom of the hill. So water, there will be plenty of affluent to water this golf course. The affluent has its own issues because it has so much salt that you have to put supplements and treatments on to counteract that. Um, but you have water here. Um, the lakes will, it'll survive, but it's, um, it just costs a lot more money to water it than it used to. Mm -hmm. Well, what other insights do you have that you think the people who watch this would want to know about your role in golf and on its reach? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope we grew it because what, What's so fun to sit at the lakes and you see four kids come in together, or you see grandparents and children together, or you see all the ladies come out together. And then have, it's such a social game. And it, it also teaches you values and you're supposed to call shots on yourself. You have to be extraordinarily patient because it's very frustrating. <laughs> it looks easy, but it's not. And so I think it provides, you meet your neighbors because it's a community golf course. Now, of course, there's lots of non-resident players. Yeah, play on Monday, uh, then play on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, and, it's, and they have leagues and groups here too. And I think, I think it's such, golf is so miraculous in the way that you can, I mean, he plays with me and he's, you know, top-notch player, I'm not, but we can go out together and have a lot of fun. You can't do that in tennis. You can't do that in many sports. You, and you, that is what, and you can play nine holes, or you can play 18 holes, or you can just come hit balls. So it's very approachable for a lot of different abilities. I mean, we had one customer at the links that had MS, and sometimes she'd like swing and her friend would catch her from falling over, but she wanted to be out with her friends. And it was, we have another friend that plays a course, and I mean, sure, he can't, he cannot wait there on one of his legs, but he goes out and plays golf, and just as much as he can. And so I feel it's been fun watching the community grow up. I think it's still a really special area. It's it's got of course every community has some issues, but Highlands Ranch is a pretty good quality of life. And if we helped with that and DU, the golf team, if we helped with that, that's such an honor and privilege to be able to do that. I you yeah, know we're pretty lucky. Yeah. I mean we got the golf business is 24-7. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in the winter the alarm goes off at the links and we had to drive in to see what was going on. Um, or here. I mean, this place got robbed a lot one summer. So it's 24-7, it's but you're doing something you love. You're outside. Everyone's here to have fun. You know, they're wearing shorts. They're wearing a golf suit, you know, golf shirt. Most of they might be happier when they check in than when they walk to the bar. <laughs> That's why you have a bar. In the outdoor patio. So to you know, people seek out this environment and we got to be here all the time. And that 
what more can you ask, really? It's, it's well, on behalf of the Historical Society, we thank you for, thank you. your insights. I appreciate you both putting this together. It's very nice. Yeah, it's fun. So, thank you again.